This excellent medical student-led podcast is for educational purposes only and not intended to be used as medical advice under any circumstance. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Thanks for tuning in. We're here for, I think, episode 12 now. We have another great case with some new discussants. We have Megan returning to lead us in discussion today. Hey, everyone. Great to be back. I'm Megan. I've been on a couple episodes before, and I'm looking forward to leading another discussion. And then, as always, Dr. Abrams is here, our fearless leader. And I'm so glad to be here today also. I um, can't believe we're up to tr- we're up to episode 12. We yeah, are episode 12. So this is it. Um, I think we have listeners in 15 countries last I counted. Wow. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll let our discussants introduce themselves. Hello, my name is Adam. Uh, I'm a third year medical student here at Rush and I'm going to apply into psychiatry. My name is Shai Farhi. I'm also a third year medical student here and I'm currently undecided on what specialty I want to pursue. Perfect. 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 (laughs) And we got to talk a little bit in the hall before, but you guys want to share what your holiday plans are, doing anything fun? For Christmas, I'm just going to go home from Southern California, get some sun. I'm from the Northern Chicago suburbs, so I'm just going to return there and hang out with family. (laughs) Awesome. How about you, Megan? Uh, I'll be going back to Arizona, so also some sunshine and hang out with family. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Dr. Abrams? I'm going to be here, although I did was talking to somebody today who's going to Sri Lanka, and I am so jealous of that trip. They're going to see whales, and they're going on <laughs> safari, and it's really sounded great. Jealous. Yeah. yeah. Very jealous. All right, let's kick things off. All right, let's get started. Whoa, we have a new consult. <laughs> the emergency department is calling. All right, yep, check your pager. We got a middle-aged woman. <laughs> She's coming in with a history of HIV. Intermittently on treatment, her last CD4 count was less than 200. Recently incarcerated with throat and facial swelling, dysphagia, and a new productive cough with shortness of breath. So this is a, a page with a lot of information in it. So I'm going to turn it over for you guys just to give your initial thoughts. Well, I think just given that she's immunocompromised uh, and not, it sounds like not on you know drug therapy, we would need to work up all of the HIV-related like, immunocompromised diseases. Yeah, I would agree. I think this... An initial impression shouts infectious to me, especially the inclusion of the CD4 count, which in these little vignettes tends to be kind of like a red flag or something, <laughs> but we'll see. Awesome. And anything not infectious that you guys would think of? I guess with like throat swelling and dysphagia, there could be like a tumor or something, or I don't know, something not infectious, but again, well, more likely. Yeah. And phylaxis. Yeah. Totally. No, both really good thoughts. I think that, I don't know, especially with all the year old questions we do, they kind of paint a picture of like exactly, they give us all the information we need to get to the answer. And I think in real life, sometimes they tell you things that are kind of leading you astray. So always good to look at the initial problem and kind of come up with a pretty broad differential. So full disclosure, I was on a consulting team that I won't name. <laughs> and this was pretty much the page we got. And we went down to see the patient in the ED. So why don't you guys put yourself, I guess, in my shoes and how are you going to target your questions? What are you, what are you initially thinking before you walk into that door that you're going to want to know from this patient? I want to know when all these things started, how severe they are, medications. It seems like HIV is probably not that well controlled, but it doesn't hurt that much. Yeah, I agree. I think just kind of getting a picture of when it all started would be like my first like path forward. Yeah. So that sounds great. And, and I think all of us would say tempo is everything. <laughs> the other thing that I often think about is because, because this, there's so much here, there's so many different pieces that are sitting here. And I look at the, and I, maybe I think of it this way, the piece that's the most unusual. Oh, I love it. So, so you know, <laughs> what which of these symptoms seems to stand out as the one that I don't want to say doesn't fit because... Clearly, this is how the patient presents, but is there one piece that seems unusual? And I don't like to say to anchor on because the danger we always do is anchor on things, but it may help guide you through, through as, as you guys have both said, I mean, God, this could be anything. Come on, let's start there. Start with that. I would say the facial swelling. Yeah, I agree. It's strange. Yeah. Uh, with like the dysphagia, you think of like uh, fungal and like oral candidiasis or something that's common in immunocompromised patients. And you could that could kind of explain a lot of this or like pneumocystis for the pneumonia, but facial swelling doesn't jump out as any like immunocompromised diagnosis. Yeah, I totally agree. I think we see a lot of like cough and shortness of breath. And usually that makes us think of something going on in the lungs. But then when you kind of combine that with a throat and facial swelling, it makes you take a step back and kind of think, all right, what else might be going on here? 
All right. We meet the patient. All right. I'll call one. So we have a 47-year-old female patient presenting to the ED with neck and facial swelling that began two weeks ago. Neck and area around her mouth began to swell. Her voice has become progressively more hoarse, and she has dysphagia without any adonophagia. So some of that's a little similar to what we got in the first page, um, but anything that you guys want to add seeing kind of this new information? The hoarseness sticks out to me. Um, maybe something involving the laryngeal or very laryngeal. Uh, I guess localizing that would be kind of like aortic area, left aorta, something like that. You got your time course now that you were hoping to get some in that previous consult message. Where, what does two weeks do with your thinking? Where does that kind of put this? Uh, I think more in line with, like, it still could be infectious. I guess I would think less likely, like, a tumor or something, like, growing, although at the same time, that maybe this is just when it became symptomatic. So, mm. I guess the two weeks is kind of, doesn't do much for me. What do you think? Yeah, I feel like it's not really a chronic thing. But I guess you never know. But I agree. It seems like something like a tumor or something compressing and causing like a SVC syndrome seems like yeah. it would be more of a, a pure chronic concept. I love what Shai said, uh, just reflecting. He characterized with it being two weeks, maybe, you know, that's kind of quick for a tumor, but maybe that's when it became symptomatic. And I have said the analogy before, but it's totally the pen rolling on the table and it suddenly falls off. So this has been like something was happening, it fell off and that's when we noticed it. So I, it's just fun to reflect and remind yourself that things happen like that. Yeah, definitely. If this had been something that came on in like an hour or even a day, there's something else that you would be thinking of in terms of the neck and facial swelling. You mentioned like, like an allergic reaction like right away, like anaphylaxis would definitely be out there. I think one of the things that, that Adam, you mentioned was the, was the hoarseness. Again, another piece that seems <laughs> funny, you say, okay, does that really anatomically help me localize things to a certain area and, and just as you said it do, it really does it, it, it puts you in it puts you in a place right and so at least the way I think because I, I do like to think anatomically I knowing that place and and what what can get in there what some of the illnesses or diseases that happen in that place I think are really important it's a it, it, it's a different way to organize things um, but I find it often to be a useful a useful thing to do that's what surgeons do all the time, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. And the, she has the difficulty swallowing, but no pain with swallowing. Do you guys have a differential or a framework that you use to think about something like that? I mean, I'm not too sure. I would think that odinophagia would be more of like a inflammatory process of the oral cavity. Um, dysphagia seems to me like it would be more of a, a structural or motility yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good way to break it down. And here they specifically tell us that she's not having pain with swallowing. But I think anytime a patient comes in and tells you that it's difficult to swallow, you always have to distinguish whether or not it's pain that's making it difficult or whether or not they feel like they can't actually swallow. And a way that they kind of like to break down dysphagia is you can have the oropharyngeal dysphagia and then you can have esophageal dysphagia. And so something that I learned is that you can actually find out a good deal about the dysphagia just by getting a really detailed history. Um, so for oropharyngeal dysphagia, that's the part of swallowing where you kind of have this food bolus and you're propelling it back towards your esophagus. Um, so patients will kind of describe, you can get like a nasal regurgitation and you feel the difficulty just initiating, initiating the swallowing movement versus esophageal dys dysphagia. They'll describe being able to swallow, but the food feels like it gets kind of stuck midway. So we don't have too much information about her dysphagia here, but just some good follow-up questions that if you ever are in the setting where you're meeting a patient with dysphagia, just to kind of localize the lesion a little bit more. Great pearls. All right, I'll call two. All right. So this patient presented to a neighboring ED twice since her first symptom onset. She was prescribed amoxicillin without any resolution of her symptoms. One week ago, she developed a cough producing white sputum, now with new shortness of breath, no hemoptysis, no fever, and she reports losing several teeth a few months ago. What are your thoughts with this new information? I feel like poor dentition is a common new world hot phrase <laughs> for like abscess. I don't yeah. know if it really necessarily fits, but kind of popped out to me. Yeah. Um, and the white sputum just, I think, points more towards like a infection. Maybe there's like component of like aspiration pneumonia on, you know, because of this dysphagia and it's two different problems. I'm not sure yet, but um, definitely sounds like there's something going on, you know, in the lungs. Definitely. Um, and what do you think about the lack of fever and the fact that she's been treated with amoxicillin without any improvement of her symptoms? I'm not sure what they were thinking. <laughs> amoxicillin, I'm not sure what they'd be targeting. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think, Adam? 
Ah. It's like a lot of like oral cavity infection with well, I, So listen, I, I, you guys are going to speak in a minute, but you know, one of the things it goes back to the anatomy. There's all these tissue planes of the neck yeah. that everybody has to worry about, yeah. and. And at least in part, I, I'll throw out one illness. Hey, it could be this because this is a surprise to me. But it, and also because I literally just heard a case of this that presented somewhat atypical, which was and Kevin will say the answer because the teeth are supposed to be a clue for it. What what what, what am I thinking of? Now I'm not sure. I'm thinking of of, 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 of the mirrors. Yes, I, I heard that case. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is this is Lemire's disease. Yeah. It, without the, without the sore throat to make yeah. bad teeth and things like that. Where did you hear that? I definitely just heard a case. Yeah, yeah. we'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to remember where I heard. But I've seen cases of it also. But eh, it's atypical. There's no fever. There's no typically presents with a sore throat. But it's just to sort of put your put your mind again, sort of in the place. I would imagine that they gave her amoxicillin because if you had a sore throat, and amoxicillin is great for strep throat. Mm-hmm. And so. And it also means that it would be unlikely for her to get a certain bacterial illnesses yeah. because she's been pretreated. Good point. Definitely. Does the lack of fever sway you towards or away from infection or what does that do for you? Well, really? I don't know. I mean, I feel like it could present without a fever. Yeah. In an immunocompromised patient, can you have, you know, underlying infections and they just can't mount a proper like immune response? Um, I think, right? That sounds right. <laughs> <laughs> you got to throw some clinical reasoning uh, ideology in here. And Shai's doing it. He's saying he's thinking of the pretest probability. Mm-hmm. This person has a really high chance of being infected with the little information we know about her. Yeah. And he's not like letting the fever change his mind all that much because he was already thinking before that pretty high chance she's infected. So good job. Moving on to the next aliquot. Um, we have this past medical history of HIV. Her most recent CD4 count was 162. She hasn't been following up with her provider for some time. She occasionally takes her partner's antiretrovirals, who also has HIV. Um, no known recent sick contacts. Two months ago, she was incarcerated for three weeks. No known TB exposures. She reports methadone use. She smoked crack cocaine most recently one week ago. And her tobacco use history is half a pack per day for the past 16 pack years. So again, rich with a lot of information. I don't know how you guys want to split it up and kind of tackle everything that we've given you so far. Do you want to go line by line? Sure. You want to start? Okay. Uh, so most recent CD4 of 162 with past medical history of HIV with not great follow-up. I mean, I guess we kind of touched on this at the beginning of this podcast, but uh, less than 200 seems to be kind of like the cutoff for a lot of these opportunistic infections. Uh, so definitely have a tip off there, especially with the information conveyed in this next bullet point. Yeah, taking the Pictardi uh, occasionally. I'm not sure what occasionally means, if that's like once a month or, you know, six days a week. Um, but definitely raised concern for, um, you know, I mean, we know that her CD4 count is not adequate, so she's definitely not taking it enough. But then also I think you have concern for like developing like resistant strains of HIV um, with like inconsistent antiretroviral uh, taking. So um, yeah, definitely concerning. We could do a whole episode on with just information of like CD4 count less than 200. But aren't you guys just off the top of your head, some of the more common things you would be worried about knowing that information? Uh, pneumocystis pneumonia for sure. TB. Um, oral thrush. Yeah, definitely. So she has this HIV infection that doesn't seem to be well controlled. And then also her recent incarceration would both be risk factors for a TB infection. Um, So we've gotten a lot of new information. And then we also kind of started with a lot of information. So I think every time you get new information, it's important to go back to what you're originally given and just make sure that everything is still fitting together. And so I know one of the things that you focused on the beginning was this throat swelling and the neck swelling. Um, How do you kind of factor that into all this new information that you've gotten? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess if I had to throw something out there, and I feel like it's very specific, so yeah. I don't know. But uh, maybe thinking about TB with incarceration, the CD4 count, the shortness of breath, the sputum. Um, I guess if it was like a secondary TB, it would be more in the apical lobes. And then in that case, it would compress on the SVC and cause like an SVC syndrome. Why is that crazy? That seems like logical to me. <laughs> seems very well for them. I love it. Although I got to say one thing, <laughs> I'm going back to Kevin, the consultant. <laughs> the only thing that's important with this person, based on your thinking, is that they are in airborne isolation. Because when I think hoarseness and I worry about TB spreading, 
I think about the Mingil TB, and you got to understand that that is the most contagious of all of because it's not even coming from your lungs, it's coming from here. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, somebody suspecting this really needs to be carefully isolated and, and everybody's got to be extremely careful until you prove that it either is or isn't that. And they were airborne and rest assured, <laughs> we were fully uh, an appropriate PDE when we saw her. <laughs> All right, great. So I want to, you guys have mentioned the sputum production a couple of times. And I just wanted to touch on that a little bit because I think that it's somewhat of a con- controversial topic. Um, I'm sure Dr. Abrams can add a little bit to it just because he has way more clinical experience than I do. But um, I've kind of heard mixed things. I know for COPD patients, the quality of the sputum is pretty important and that in and of itself can be criteria to start a patient on antibiotics. Um, but for just your average patient without COPD coming in, the sensitivity and the specificity of like the mucus color reported by the patient has kind of come into question a lot recently. And before a lot of people were using that as criteria to suggest more of a bacterial infection and give antibiotics. Um, but I did find a study kind of talking about, they looked at the sensitivity and specificity of reported sputum color by the patient. And then they also took the sputum into the lab where apparently they can assess the color of that too. Um, so that was news to me, but for just the self-reported sputum color, the sensitivity is 73% and the specificity was 39%. So it can be kind of helpful if you're maybe trying to rule out a bacterial infection, but in terms of ruling it in at 39%, they're just the patient telling you they've been coughing up green sputum, um, Less not necessarily, <laughs> yeah, not necessarily helpful. You're I guess better off like flipping a coin to decide whether or not they have a bacterial pneumonia. And I think they've known that since I was a medical student. Yeah. <laughs> so so. The, the, the clues are obviously fever is a potential yeah. clue. And it's not so much what colors your sputum, it's how is your sputum changed? So, if you, so many people have, a, so if you didn't have a cough and now you're coughing, that potentially is meaningful. And if you're, if your sputum, say my sputum went from whatever to, you know, bright green or the amount of sputum that those are potential clues that uh, you have an exacerbation of some kind of COPD and maybe you'll benefit from antibiotics. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then just other than infection, I know we've been focusing a lot on infection just with her CD4 count and her history. Um, anything besides her infection that you guys just want to make sure that you keep on your differential just to kind of consider everything? And I'm not going to lie, I'm pretty anchored on infection. <laughs> so I agree. <laughs> yeah, I guess you can still like include like some sort of tumor, uh, you know, of non-infectious like etiology in the esophagus or something compressing on neck structures. But yeah, I agree with Adam. Okay. And anything about her crack cocaine use that sticks out to you or makes you think of anything? Well, honestly, yeah, no, it's not a trick question. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. It's totally fine. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. If she snored a bit, then I guess like that can predispose her to like a sinus or like sure yeah. infection, but smoking it, I don't know. Nothing jumps There's a whole me. litany or list of very complications of cocaine use mm-hmm. and right. and we will go through the whole list but but it, it, it there's there's a sort of a broad range of complications from hemorrhage to you know all the way down to pulmonary infarction and things like that yeah definitely there's something that's called crack lung is what they call it it's like a casual name for it um something that typically occurs or occurs anywhere from one to 48 hours after smoking crack and so you can see it usually it's like more of an inflammatory kind of like a hypersensitivity pneumonitis that these patients get um so you'll see fever hypoxia they can be coughing up blood and they can go into full-blown respiratory failure so less likely with the way this patient's presenting but it was something that i learned kind of recently that i had never heard of so all right so we'll move on to aliquot four here we have the physical exam the vitals for her blood pressure 130 over 65 Temperature 98.1, heart rate 82, breathing at 13 breaths per minute and satting 99% on room air. On her HEMT exam, she has bilateral neck swelling, mildly tender to palpation, no palpable lymphadenopathy, no tonsillar erythema or exudate, poor dentition, and her pupils are equal and reactive to light. Um, her cardiovascular exam, normal rate and rhythm, normal heart sounds. Her respiratory exam, normal effort. Her lungs are clear bilaterally without any crackles or wheezing. Her abdomen is soft, non-tender to palpation, no hepatosplenomegaly, no masses, no rebound, no guarding, and no CVA tenderness. And then on her neuro exam, no cranial nerve deficits. So anything that you guys see here that surprises you or anything you're expecting to see that's not here, what do you guys make of all of this? I mean, it's kind of what we were already given. Uh, there's just like no other surprises, I guess, on the exam, like in the cardiovascular or abdominal exam uh, or even respiratory exam, I guess. Um, I think the big thing that jumps out to me is the mild tenderness to palpation of the neck, suggesting more like an inflammatory um, issue or, yeah. What do you think? Yeah, the head and neck exam is the only one with like stuff there that we have to pay attention to. But the absence of stuff in like respiratory, I guess I'm a little surprised there's no crackles. Um, I was surprised too. 
Yeah. And I think that just kind of brings up a good point that, I don't know, sometimes we find crackles on the respiratory exam and it's really helpful, but sometimes you can get a chest x-ray after thinking that the lungs sound completely clear. And whether that's me just not being very good at listening to lungs or <laughs> just a hard physical exam, um, I think that, yeah, it's important to make sure that you're not excluding anything solely based on the physical exam. But obviously if it is there, it can help you. So anything on vitals that stick out to you or anything you're expecting to see? Megan's right. The vital signs are such a big part of the so rich. Yeah, so there's rich. so much. First of all, there's just a lot. To, it's not just one vital sign. There's a lot of vital signs there. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, what, what do you guys find to be the most striking thing about her about her vital signs? They're all within normal. Within and they're really normal, <laughs> yeah, aren't they? Yeah. Every every piece of it is normal. So yeah, she was describing the shortness of breath, but it looks like she's satting well. She's breathing comfortably at 13 breaths per minute. So just in terms of kind of thinking whether or not you have to just worry acutely about the patient that's coming in um, and worry about stabilizing them before diagnosing them. I think in this case, you can be fairly reassured by the vitals and kind of move more towards the diagnosis. Yeah. As, a, as the consulting team, we assumed that the, the primary team handling this, this is an ABC case just from that information, like throat swelling, shortness of breath, is her airway... Peyton, can she protect it? And I think seeing the vitals here, we can rest a little more assured that we have some time to think. Got a question. What did she look like when you saw her? She looked super sick. She looked sick. Yeah. She was uh, laying in bed kind of on her side, um, just looked kind of beat up, like, like she'd been through a lot, uh, tired, frustrated. At not She'd been to two ERs previously and had told she had an infection and was treated and didn't get better. And so she decided to come here and, I think she, for how I perceived her, reflected what she'd been through. Mm. And guys, I did a full cranial nerve exam on her. <laughs> um, I, I, I am thinking, since we talked about vital signs, there actually is one vital sign I would find very helpful in her that's missing. Okay. Which is her, I'll say her BMI. Yes. Uh, <laughs> she, she, uh, she had a normal American BMI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, What's I would, that? I would, I, yeah, that's, that doesn't help. I would, she probably, at a BMI between 28, 32. Okay. All right. You ready for some labs? So on her um, electrolytes, we have a sodium of 140, potassium of 3.9, chloride of 105, bicarb of 25, BUN 15, creatinine 0.99, glucose of 74, protein 7.9, albumin 3.2, which is a little low. Her calcium is 8.7, T-billy 0.3, alpha 76. Um, and then in terms of her CBC, the white blood cell count, six, red blood cell count, a little low, 3.28, hemoglobin, 10.8, hematocrit, 34.4, and her platelet count, 269. And then we got her CD4 count, which is low at 162. Pretty normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why don't you put her into some buckets of like what might be involved tying in what she's complaining about? I guess with a WBC6, not a super high white count for infection, but I'll, I'm not super familiar with how white counts change in patients with HIV AIDS. Okay, do we have a differential on the white blood cells? I'm sure we did. Um, <laughs> I'll, instead of make something up, let's just go with it wasn't relevant. <laughs> but I think Adam raises a good point. And it was something I thought of for sure, like her white blood cell count is six, but what we know about HIV, how does that fit in? Like is, is six normal? Could that be a sign of like leukocytosis? A good question. Yeah, I really like that you brought that up. And I think a lot of just like being a third year medical student is not necessarily knowing the answers to everything, but seeing something and being like, well, how would this fit into what I do know about the patient? And once you have that, you can kind of ask the right questions and look up the right stuff. So just having that curiosity and making sure that you're considering everything and just interpreting labs in the context of the patient and not just like in the context of everyone, I think is really important. I think one of the questions I would ask you guys is this. And, and, you know, we, we put things in buckets, right? We put things in the infectious bucket or we put things into the you know, autoimmune bucket. And, and so, again, we, we often start in a bucket. We, as much as we think we don't, we start in a bucket. And it is what you've seen so far made you sort of rethink your bucketing. What do you think of your bucket? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we've been kind of all in on infection and in a low CD4 count, HIV positive patient. And I, I don't think my bucket has changed. Yeah. Maybe I'm, we're missing something. I am living in that bucket as well. Uh, so we'll have to see what else comes in. But yeah, I agree with you. Are there any other buckets that you want to consider? Just based on, I know you're expecting a little bit more lab abnormalities. Um, so it sounds like you're still pretty set on infection, but 
maybe a little bit less convinced than you were before? Is there anything else that you're thinking of? I don't know. I mean, I feel like the only thing I can think of is tumor we were talking about. I'm like kind of fixated on this like SVC syndrome. Um, yeah. That's the only thing I get that would cause that. So I'm not sure. I mean, there, there are, there's a differential for sure. Of, like you mentioned, F- SVC syndrome. And I, I think just keeping the infection bucket, but then tying that back in, you know, there's this talked about in the first Tahlequah, like this throat swelling, facial swelling, and that's got you a little bit away from infection, thinking about other things. So then just keeping in mind that there's a whole other world of things that could be leading to something that's compressing something, right? Like infectious and not. Now with some basic labs, what are you guys investigating next? Are we Yeah, <laughs> it would be very helpful here. Okay, so we have some additional data. Um, so for the micro, we got group A strep, PCR, RPP, crypto, PJP, TB, syphilis, histo, Legionella, sputum bacterial and fungal cultures, and blood cultures, and everything came back negative. Real time, all wow. negative. <laughs> <laughs> Very efficient, all incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we also have the chest x-ray you asked for. It shows these ill-defined ground glass opacities in the right lung base with additional questioned opacities posterior to the trachea on a lateral view, suspicious for infection in the appropriate context. Non-aggressive appearing sclerotic focus and the proximal right humerus, indeterminate, although with features more suggestive of benign etiology. And then lastly, we have the CT soft tissue of the neck, just with all the swelling she's been having, which showed moderate retropharyngeal edema with enlargement of the bilateral palatine tonsils and uvula, associated moderate narrowing of the supraglottic airway, multiple mildly enlarged bilateral level two and three neck lymph nodes, which may be reactive, no well-defined peripherally enhancing cystic collection. And then scattered consolidated opacities in the posterior right lung apex, additional ground glass opacity in the left lung apex, and then complete opacification of the right maxillary sinus, mild mucosal thickening of the left maxillary sinus. So a lot of words here. You guys need a couple minutes to just fully absorb all of it. Take your time. But what are you thinking with all of this? We can even start with just the micro being all negative. It's not good for us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and obviously those things came back over a period of days. Yeah. But when we got this imaging, it was like, oh, okay. I had some things to think about after that. For sure. Yeah. The opacity posterior to the trachea, I feel like... I feel like it should be jumping out at me, but I, I can't quite put my finger on what the diagnosis is. What do you think, Adam? Does anything jump out? Uh, anatomically, I'm very weak at this area. It's funny, we were just talking outside. It sounds like esophageal. How right? complex like head and neck anatomy is. Yeah, <laughs> it's coming back. It's a lot of words yeah. there, too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess with the enlarged lymph nodes, the bilateral level two and three lymph nodes, definitely more indicative of like a malignant process, perhaps, over that of an infection especially with the presence of edema. Yeah, I guess now, since our infection bucket is largely dead, I think we would have to think of like lymphatic insufficiency in the neck, uh, especially given like the enlarged lymph nodes um, as maybe a source of that swelling. Did we get a description of, was it facial plethora, like redness, like it was blood, or was it like generalized edema of the neck? Great, great question. It's a, it, she's African-American, so it was difficult for me to appreciate changes in her skin color. Her facial swelling was for sure asymmetric. It was greater on the right, but definitely extended to the left, just not to the same degree, which was interesting. Um, And it was most noticeable in the neck compared to the face. So just starting with the chest x-ray, the radiologists like to kind of talk about interpreting everything in the appropriate context. They tell us what I see, but then it's kind of our jobs to take what they're telling us and make sure that we're applying it in a way that makes sense. Um, so they're saying suspicious for infection. Do you guys think infection has completely been ruled out in her or are you still a little bit suspicious? I guess anything is possible, <laughs> but my suspicion is very low at this point. I think there still could be like an abscess or something. And I think maybe mm-hmm. then, you know, you wouldn't see positive blood cultures potentially if it was walled off really well, but um, Something that got us engaged was it was a CT soft tissue and neck, but it caught the apex of the lung. There's mention of some lung findings as well. Scattered opacities in the right lung apex and round glass opacity in the left lung apex. So I don't really know what would be a multifocal thing other than like metastasis to the lungs. So you get that information, are you happy with it? Or what would you do next? I feel like I'm not happy. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know what's happening. And also, it's a bad situation for the patient. And I guess I phrased it, it was sort of read my mind, but we only caught the apex of the lungs. We should probably figure out what's going on in the rest of the lungs. It's more 
definitively. I know we have the chest x-ray, but TT is definitely going to pick up things the chest, chest x-ray can. Megan, do you have anything you want to touch on before we move on? Um, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the ground glass opacities. I feel like that's a word or a phrase, I guess, that's kind of been thrown around a lot, especially with COVID. Um, that's kind of the classic buzzword that you hear a lot with COVID. Um, but I personally didn't really know much about ground glass opacities, like exactly what it meant. Um, and so it's a pretty nonspecific finding um, based on kind of what I read about it. So you can see it with infectious processes. Um, they're like opportunistic, opportunistic infections like PJP pneumonia, um, basically anything that can cause pneumonia and like an immunocompromised patient. But you can also see it in non-opportunistic infections. You can see it in like chronic interstitial lung diseases like eosinophilic pneumonia, idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. You can see it in alveolar diseases like a hypersensitivity pneumonitis um, and then other causes. So you can see it with drug toxicity. You can see it with malignancy. Um, so I think that it's not the most helpful finding in terms of telling us exactly what it is. It tells us that there's definitely something going on in the lungs, but I think in terms of being able to like anchor to ground glass opacities and use that to tell you what's going on, it's definitely something that requires a little bit more investigation. When you cross paths with our pulmonologists or intensivists and you mention ground glass opacities or they'll just say GGOs, <laughs> they'll be like, well, okay, but what is that telling us? What, are the, what, are, what does that mean? And they're looking for, well, it's either blood, pus, water or protein. And then from that, you have a differential and that's what they're looking for. So priming you guys for that moment. <laughs> Blood, pus, or protein. What was their fourth? Like edema, water. Yes. Yeah. All right. So moving on, we have a little bit more imaging. We got a CT chest without contrast, which showed this multilobulated spiculated nodule in the anterior right upper lobe, measuring 1.6 by 1.2 by 1.2 centimeters with pleural tag extending up to the right anterior pleura, anterior pleura, enlarged lymph nodes in the right paratracheal region and likely right hilar region, multifocal ground glass opacities in the bilateral lungs, enlarged lymph nodes, axillary and subpectoral right paratracheal, mediastinal and right hilar and focal lucency at superior T10 vertebral body. Extensive stranding is seen throughout the anterior mediastinum. I know Kevin kind of saw this in real time, so I don't know if you want to add yeah. a little bit about so what your team was thinking. When the CT chest results came back, in particular, the extensive stranding in the anterior mediastinum caught our attention. and We actually immediately called, I think the patient was still in the ED, and we requested them to repeat the study, but with contrast. So we were worried about an anterior mediastinitis in this patient. All right. So we'll go over the exam with contrast and then you guys can kind of discuss everything. Um, so associated large right lower paratracheal lymph node conglomerate extending to the right hilum with mass effect and severe narrowing slash stenosis of the SVC, narrowing of the right superior pulmonary vein, right upper, right upper lobe segmental and subsegmental branches. Associated chest wall and mediastinal edema as well as multiple mediastinal collaterals secondary to central venous obstruction. So again, a lot of words, um, but what are your thoughts based on this? Respect to the extensive stranding, honestly, yeah. I'm really not sure what stranding even is. I think it's generally just inflammation. I think yeah. that that's right. I think yeah. it's generally inflammation. And just as Kevin said, people were worried that that she had mediastinitis, which would be bad because, yeah. because you start thinking, how can I get mediastinitis? And the other thing is, it doesn't necessarily fit because people with mediastinitis are really, really, really sick. Really sick right? Because you've got... Again, you think about tissue planes and everything's across your chest. So let's even start just with, because I know there's a lot of things here that, I mean, as a third year med student, aren't going to make complete sense to us. Um, we have this multilobulated spiculated nodule in the anterior right lobe. Um, just kind of looking at that specifically, what's your differential for it or what does it make you think of? I think spiculated is a buzzword, something that I can't remember. <laughs> it's a buzzword that I recognize and I yeah, don't know as a buzzword, but I want to say cancer. I don't know. <laughs> No. One thing I've learned is if you kind of feel like you don't know, but you have something in your head telling you to go with it, that probably somewhere in your brain, you have that information and it's almost always right. Okay. So yeah, we have a speculated nodule and then with some enlarged lymph nodes as well. I mean, for me, if I saw this, I would just kind of focus on the things that I do recognize and things that make sense to me. And again, I don't know too much about extensive stranding and the anterior mediastinum um, would worry about inflammation, but yeah, you see the speculated nodule and then you see enlarged lymph nodes. Um, so you're saying that to you sounds like it would be a little bit concerning for something that is static. Yeah. And I think now instead of TB, you know, causing the SVC syndrome now, like a pan ghost, you know, primary mm -hmm. lung tumor, um, I guess based on the CT, that's kind of top of my head. What do you think? Yeah, I would agree. Then why don't we jump down to the with contrast, that first paragraph. How does that tie in with what you just brought up with pan ghost? 
uh, the mass effect yeah. cause. So, I mean, that's our radiographic confirmation SVC syndrome right there. Now, I guess, why? What's causing it, right? And I think I really love the second point there because I think it really adds to the time course of this, this whole picture. But I know a little bit's cut off there, but mm -hmm. it's got chest wall and mesial edema and then multiple mediastinal collaterals. Collaterals don't just pop up. Are we thinking if it's a tumor, it's got increased blood supply? There's collaterals popping up. Is that kind of more venous collaterals? And it's like been growing for a long time, and she's been you know compensating with the collaterals. But now, like we talked about, the pen rolling and then falling off the table. This maybe is is that in this lung tumor? So whatever's tried nailed it. Whatever is there, it's been there, and her body's compensated for that by you know forming collateral blood vessels to get around this obstruction. Right. I think there's a couple more things in here that kind of adds the layers of this case. And we we're, we're thinking about the speculated nodule and we see some enlarged lymph nodes, but then we also get more information of more enlarged lymph nodes in, you know, more distal locations. Uh, that was a really helpful kind of branch point for me and my thinking on this case. All right. And then just kind of taking a step back to the beginning of the case. So we have this patient coming in with the neck and facial swelling, um, the hoarseness, the dysphagia, the shortness of breath, the cough. Is there anything that you think isn't explained by this? Or do you think that this kind of ties everything together? I think the cough with sputum, you know, if we are to take the sputum seriously, which maybe we're not now uh, after your pearl earlier, <laughs> um, but the sputum doesn't fit, but I think the cough could just be from, you know, local irritation and it could be more of like an upper airway triggered cough than like a true like lung infection. Um, but also maybe the tumor itself could cause a cough. Yeah. And I think you brought up a good point earlier where it can also like, just because it's something malignant doesn't mean there can also be an infection. It's like the classic pathoma teaching where if there's something blocking a doctor or tube, you can always get infection behind it. So yeah, we don't have to say it's only one thing or only the other. There can certainly be a couple things going on. And what are you guys going to do next? How are you going to figure out what this is? Um, consult on. <laughs> <laughs> what's what's on? I'll tell you what, they'll say, call us after. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, got to get a diagnosis first. <laughs> if you think it's malignancy. I don't know if you would. I guess it depends if we think it's primary pulmonary malignancy or right. metastasis. Because pulmonary, if it's like adenocarcinoma versus squamous versus small cell, there's various unique points to each one. The person, great though. Are you gonna confirm a, a diagnosis of malignancy? Lymph node biopsy, maybe. You got to biopsy something, right? Yeah. So, what's your target here? What are you going after? I don't know. It wouldn't be the easiest to access. That's that's that's, that's, the, that's right the right answer. answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you can get to safely and easily, and it's it doesn't make sense now in aliquots, but. I was on pulmonology and we were consulted and the next step for this patient was bronchoscopy. Uh, one for infectious workup because those labs didn't come back for days. Right. And it, it was actually a lot of the bronch labs where those were checked from. So we, we needed a good sputum from this person, but we also had this imaging finding where with bronchoscopy, you can do a guided biopsy. So that's actually what they did. So that's our next aliquot. All right. So we have a bronchoscopy um, with a bronchiolar lavage, which is negative for infection. And then a small, completely obstructing, fungating, erythematous, and vascular lesion was found in the anterior segment of the right upper lobe. Yeah, sounds like cancer. <laughs> yeah, vascular growth and, yeah, bad news. <laughs> Anything to add? I agree, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything to add. I got a challenge, Adam. You brought up some good points last aliquot now. We, you know, our signal's pointing at primary lung at this point, I think. Uh -huh. You mentioned some stuff about, you know, differentiating factors. Obviously, we'll get a, a histologic read on the biopsy, but why don't you apply what you know already to kind of stratify what this could possibly be? Yeah, so I guess the first thing I'm looking at is location. The, the S sounds are at the center, so like squamous and small cell. Yeah. Seems like not super consistent based on location of where this lesion is. I'm thinking more of adenocarcinoma, especially considering that there's no like abnormal calcium value. So I, I feel like that well rule out squamous cell. Why do you mention that? Uh, the PTHRP or the like hypercalcemia of malignancy that you should see sometimes, I think, with squamous cell carcinoma yeah. lung. What is the epidemiology of the classic patient with adenocarcinoma? No, I don't think it's related to smoking. I think it's the non-smokers, generally like middle-aged women. 
um, which fits for her. So you can see in the corner there, we have a nickel. I'm going <laughs> to ask you guys to put your nickel down on a final diagnosis. And it's tough to not be in the infection bucket anymore. <laughs> 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 your buckets were overturned. <laughs> I think it was solidly, yeah. You talk about the auto bucket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I think adenocarcinoma, yeah. primary, causing yeah. ankos tumor with mass effect. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we got a lymph node biopsy, adenocarcinoma, and a lung biopsy, which showed adenocarcinoma. So final diagnosis, you guys truly could not have been more correct. Uh, it's like you read the case before we presented it to you. <laughs> Primary adenocarcinoma of the lung with metastatic spread presenting as SVC syndrome. And I think I heard that possibility on the first yeah. Yeah. plot. Adam's <laughs> throughout. Yeah. One of the first things. <laughs> <all> SVC syndrome. <laughs> yeah. it's like, all right. So we, we have some good teaching points we'll go through in a second, but let's let's reflect for a minute. And then before we do, this was a recent case. So I, was, I actually followed up uh, to kind of see where this patient's at. And they had a stent placed for to help relieve the obstruction in the SCC and then was presented a tumor board, some multidisciplinary pulmonology was involved, uh, obviously the oncologists and also the cardiothoracic surgeons. It was cool to take part in that. A lot of the discussion went around staging. And so she had, you know, full body imaging at this point and some stuff lit up. And I, I later learned more recently, she's concerning for adrenal and vertebral mets. Uh, she was just back in the hospital for, she had some complications, pericardial fusion with amplified physiology. Now she's having recurrent uh, thromboses while on anticoagulation. So her case is complicated and um, she's dealing with a lot. So why don't we reflect to that basic consult message that I got? And why don't you guys, you know, just tie in how your thinking started, how it changed and what do you, what do you think now? Well, our bucket changed, for sure. Um, I think we were both pretty fixated on something infectious. There seemed to be a lot of buzzwords for infectious process. Um, and Were you wrong to be fixed on infection? I don't think we were wrong to be thinking of infection, but to be fixated on it, I think, could be dangerous. In we got there eventually. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we were... This is a case that progressed over, you know, we didn't get to this point for a couple of days, right? Right. And I... I think you got to be fixed on infection at first because that's the most acute that's going to require us to do something. So it's an infection in this high pretest probability. It's infection until we for sure say it's not. Because right. what are we going to do about the, the lung cancer tomorrow? Can't really do much, but we better get her on antibiotics if that's if it's an infection. I think one thing to, to think about, though, and again, as Kevin says, you know, you got to you got to treat the urgent stuff urgently, and and you know. You know, we didn't talk. If she had a fever. You would not. Not only would you have thought of that, you would have given her. Yeah. Even if she had lung cancer, yeah. ultimately you would have given her antibiotics. She would have gone front on that. But I, I think the thing to remember is that is that HIV, particularly advanced HIV, people, people get to the age range, they are at higher risk of malignancy, and and we don't think about that. It be, and part of the reason is just as was said, and that is, is that there's all this other, there's all this other signal that says infection, 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 but, but they are at, in, I mean, they're at risk of both specific HIV related malignancies, but then just malignancies in, in general. Yep. And so it's, it's, it's one of those things you kind of keep in the back of your, in the back of your mind. And, and as you work through something like this, particularly after you get all the negative, and remember, even this too, all that stuff could have been negative and, you know, without the lung mass, this still could have been infection because I don't know, but, you know, TB culture sometimes yeah. takes six weeks to get to come back. And so, and, and, you know, there's 50 infections. We probably didn't, yeah, like, didn't, didn't car, check yeah. before. <laughs> <laughs> right. Fungal infections. All, TB, yeah. All the fungals. Atypical TB plus, you know, 50 other things that we've probably never heard of. So you're, you're never wrong. You're never wrong doing that. And it's sort of like you say, it's, it's so much of this is about keeping our mind open yeah. to, to other things, particularly as, as cases evolve. I mean, sure, it sounds great to get the answer from the first word, but that's just not how things work in practice. I, I think it's much more dangerous to always anchor and never get off yeah. than, 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 than evolve or to diagnosis. I love what you said there. And it just, I, the thought's probably better in my head, but like, 
with our training as students and all of these question banks we do, it's all about quickly identifying particular patterns or buzzwords, and then we get the right answer and it makes us feel good. And that is not how practice works. It is never that quick. It is never, it is always all these buzzwords gets you thinking one thing and it's usually never that. So it, it's a good thing. It's a good reflection and learning for you guys, especially as you're just, I guess, wrapping up the first year in real clinical training. Um, not sure where I was going to go after that. <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't stop when you're a third year medical student. Let me, let me tell you that now, because you know, now for me, you know, so many years later, I, I, I'm actually more surprised now than I think I was, you know, 30 years ago and, and more humbled by, humbled by this whole process. Yeah, definitely. I think you come into third year, or at least I do, and you want everything to just be interesting and exciting. And I don't know, sometimes it is just a simple heart failure exacerbation, but I'll remember a patient that I had not that long ago who she came in and kind of classic heart failure. So we treated her for it and she just wasn't getting better. And we ended up working her up for cardiac amyloid and cardiac sarcoid and we're running all these crazy tests on her. And ultimately we couldn't even figure out exactly what the diagnosis was, but I don't know. It's kind of like you start off trying to think everything's something like a zebra yeah. and then you realize it's not, but then you also don't want to go too far on the other end where you think every <laughs> things not a zebra because then you might might miss the ones that are so. absolutely i've so far in rotations definitely convinced my residents to order this they're like it's definitely not this and i don't think yeah, i don't think it ever has been a zebra that i've convinced them Never. but it will be one day it will be one day and i make the argument you know and think through it definitely someone at noon report the other day it was i think it was the case you're at or it was on monday he just like from the, the crowd yelled Whipple's disease. And they're like, oh, that's like a one in a million diagnosis. He goes, well, you can't make the diagnosis. If you don't think it. Yeah. <laughs> so exactly. Um, we can move on to some teaching points. So Megan has some SVC for us. All right. Yeah. So just going back to SVC syndrome, um, you guys did a great job of just kind of catching it in the beginning. Um, so yeah, anytime you see kind of the head and neck swelling, um, that's the first thing I think that at least my mind goes to. Um, and so in this case, it was something that was like more slow growing, which is classic for like a tumor, but every once in a while, you can't have something acute, like a clot, um, that causes just more of like a rapid onset SVC syndrome. Um, but majority of cases are due to lung cancer or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is another one that likes to present that way. Um, and so you see the classic like facial and upper extremity edema, present with chest pain, respiratory symptoms, um, occasionally neurologic manifestations. Um, and just treatment wise, it can be something that can come in as something that requires really emergent treatment, or in our case, the patient looked like she was pretty sick, but vitals wise, she seemed pretty stable. Um, and so didn't have to, we were able to kind of get to the diagnosis before um, management, but yeah, in some cases it can represent a true medical emergency. And so making sure you stabilize the patient with the airway, breathing, circulation, all of that before moving forward to the diagnosis is important. Um, there's some literature kind of suggesting steroids can be used. Um, just in the acute setting to help with inflammation and then even diuretics um, and making sure not to overhydrate these patients just because anything you do that can kind of worsen the edema will obviously not help them. So just a couple of pearls. Then I just wanted to kind of broad stroke lung cancer teaching points. And I've been working on an infographic that I'm going to share on our Twitter, uh, kind of highlighting a lot of these points and then some additional stuff, but just broadly risk smoking, obviously asbestos, the older you are, the more likely you are to have lung cancer. And then this is a popular question we get on screening and it's doing low dose CTs if you're in the 50 to 80 year old range and have a significant smoking history or have quit within less than 15 years. Uh, something I'll get in more in the infographic is the clinical presentation can actually guide you a lot and you can use anatomic clues to help you. And then with lung cancer, it's a really a dichotomous uh, division. It's either non-small cell lung cancer, which is the majority of cases with adeno being the, the big culprit and then squamous and large cell. It's really associated with molecular drivers. It follows the TNM staging system, um, role surgery, adjuvant chemotherapy and immunotherapy as part of the treatment with cure actually being the goal for non-small cell, whereas small cell is 15% of cases, it's often neuroendocrine, it's rapidly dividing and aggressive, staged completely differently, which I didn't know. It's either limited or extensive. And that's based on uh, if it's involved to one radiographic field. So if there's any contralateral involvement, whether it be a lymph node, it's automatically extensive. If on the same side, it involves the pleura or the pericardium, it becomes extensive. So it's a very low threshold to become extensive. Basically, any involvement elsewhere puts it in the extensive category, and that kind of changes the treatment and prognosis. And then Adam started to get into this a little bit as part of the discussion, but lung cancer is 
really associated with some interesting perineoblastic phenomenon. And he, he mentioned the humoral hypercalcemia malignancy. You also get all the endocrine stuff like SIADH, Cushing's. There's the neurological stuff, mostly with small cell, like Lambert Eaton's, subacute combined, and then acephalitis. And then there's the rheumatologic stuff like dermatomyositis, polymyositis, and hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. So these patients can present in a, a total, just how they present can be so interesting. I mean, this patient presented with SBC syndrome, likely a pan cost phenomenon, and that's the presenting symptoms for her lung cancer. Yeah, we heard one earlier this week of a, of a, of a Lambert Eaton wow. syndrome. Uh, yeah. They presented, and it's like you say, and, and, and a lot of these perineoblastic syndromes can pre, it's almost predate yeah. your yeah. ability to even find the tumor. Mm-hmm. I mean, so somebody has it, then you know you're, you're going on a you're going on a tumor hunt. Yeah. Yeah, I was reading like up to 60% of SVC syndromes are the initial symptom of a primary lung cancer. So it's kind of the first way that they can present, which is crazy to think about more than half the time. Uh, did you guys look for the Horner syndrome in this person? I have asked that since I see this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Really <laughs> so we didn't want to get into it, but I put it there that I did my full cranial nerve exam. <laughs> that's right. I was trying to, but yeah, she had like, her pupils were equal and they reacted appropriately. She didn't have any like... Uh, palsies of her eyes, which I, I honestly was looking for. So that's why I did it. Otherwise I probably wouldn't have, but yeah, no, great thought, especially I think it's like that C8 T1 region. If it gets that sympathetic chain, you get the Horner syndrome. What is that? Tosis, meiosis, anhydrosis. <laughs> yeah. Well, All right, guys. Time. Thanks for coming on. Uh, really appreciate it. Hope you guys had a fun time doing this. You guys did great. I hope, you know, your eyes opened a little bit to the world of clinical reasoning and how much, how much more you know than you might think you do. You guys have any ninth inning reflections before we close out? I don't. Thanks so much for having us. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. You guys are great. They both disclosed before that they've never listened to a diagnostic reasoning podcast before. So the fact that this is the first time they did it and they got a diagnosis and made it look easy. It's very impressive. Yeah, so congratulations thank you guys, you guys for coming. It's a lot of fun to discuss. Happy holidays you. to you guys. Yes. And to everyone listening. <laughs> All right. We'll see you next time. Thanks again for listening person, time, and place. We'll see you next time.